we're going to go ahead and get started. Like, can you, oh, are you just messing with me? Uh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> welcome, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, CSG team is thrilled to be spending it here with you guys. And uh, welcome as we uh, dip our toes into the cybersecurity world once again. This week, we're going to be talking about network-based security. But first. First, if you, here's how you get in touch with us. So uh, if you're interested in joining our mailing list, please add a check next to add to mailing list on our sign-in sheet. Side, side note, if you haven't signed in, please sign in. It helps us a bunch. Uh, we have a website. You can reach us at csg.utdallas.edu, and we uh, post announcements and the uh, slides to that website. Uh, we encourage you to join Slack with us. Join uh, UTD's ECS Slack, and we have a channel dedicated just for us. And if for whatever reason you need to email us, you can reach us at utdcsg at gmail.com. All right. Announcements. So for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about wanting to um, host lab hangouts and uh, really s sort of open up the lab to visitors to come and chill with us and have talks about security or maybe come you know, uh, practice some cybersecurity skills with us. I think that would be really fun. Or if you just want to come to have a chill place to work on homework, that's cool too. So starting tomorrow and every Thursday afterwards at 4 PM, we're going to open up the lab for visitors. So highly encourage you guys to come hang out with us. Uh, on February 24th, which isn't this Saturday, but the Saturday afterwards, we will have a, uh, an event, a pen testing session that will be in here at uh, 1 PM. And you know, come show up, and we'll have fun uh, pen testing together. And we bothered you about this last week, and we're going to keep bothering you about it. Starting March 5th, you can sign up to register for State Farm's Capture the Flag competition. Um, it's going to be big. It's going to be a lot of fun. I think there's going to be prizes, right? Yeah. So highly encourage you guys to, when it opens up, to sign up and show up and play with us. And we'll bother you until March 12th. And after that, we'll pester you if you didn't sign up, because we're nice. Anyways, so getting right into it. So just as a brief overview of what we're going to look at this evening, um, just due to the nature of this talk, it's necessary to sort of go over some networking basics, so I'll run through that pretty quick. And then um, give a few words on how you, can how you can use your infrastructure to secure your network. And then Andrew is going to come in and talk about firewalls and various demo various softwares uh, to monitor your network and protect it with like an IDS, IPS, et cetera. And then after the, afterwards, I'm going to come back and uh, end it on a sort of a non-technical note and talk a little bit about uh, social engineering threats and how they can be mitigated and how that sort of ties into security culture. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so networking overview, overview, a quick overview of the basics. So I'm going to sort of go a little bit quick through this, because I'm assuming that a lot of you guys are pretty familiar uh, with a lot of these terms. If you're not, and if I'm going too fast, just yell at me. Um, so first of all, LAN, local area network, I'm sure you guys are, are familiar with the term. You've got all of your machines that are near you, and they connect together, and they can talk to each other. And even if they're not connected to the internet, uh, your local area network, can you can talk to other machines on your network. And then routing packets, that bullet point, what I really want to get across is the idea that um, it's more efficient to route information if you chop it up into packets, smaller pieces. So even if you're you know, sending somebody a huge one gigabyte image of your hardware, it will still get chopped up into packets in order to uh, get routed to whoever you're sending it to. Routers, I'm sure you're familiar with them. Uh, they take those packets, they read, all right, what's the IP address, where is this going, and it's going to pass it on along a chain of more routers, and eventually your information is going to get, hopefully, make it to its destination. Switches are a little bit tricky because they're sort of similar to routers. 
they also sort of direct flow of information. Um, I'm not. I'm going to avoid getting too deep into uh, the exact differences, like between level two and level three routing, which is really the primary difference between switches and routers. Uh, but I think that one really helpful way to uh, envision it is that a switch sort of serves to connect together a bunch of nodes that make up your local area network. And then routers are what's going to connect your local area network to the rest of the internet. Ports. Um, what I'm trying to get across here is that, well, so, so ports from a networking perspective is, uh, it sort of describes a descriptor, descriptor that you add to your traffic to let it know sort of where it's going and what its purpose is. So um, there are a couple of very common, commonly used ports that are sort of reserved, like port 80 for HTTP traffic. So if you're sending some HTTP traffic, you're going to send it to port 80. It's going to reach that other local area network. It's going to forward. It's going to read that port, and it's going to forward that to your web server. And the web server is the web server's OS is going to read oh port 80. That means it wants to talk to this web application. So it's going to go there. And firewalls. I'm sure you've heard of firewalls. It's a uh, sort of a filter you put between something that you you trust and like, and something that you don't like so much, or don't trust so much, I should say. And um, so, and ideally, that firewall is going to filter out incoming traffic and drop any malicious stuff, ideally. And you can have it like maybe that trusted thing that you're protecting is just your computer, so you have a host-based firewall, and everything else is going to run through this filter. Or maybe, uh, for example, in our context, talking about network security, oftentimes you will have, or pretty much always, you'll have a firewall between your public-facing router and the rest of your network, so that the internet at large can't just send potentially malicious traffic straight to you. Ideally, you have a firewall to, to block that. And if you have a particularly big network, as is the case in many corporate environments, you might have firewalls on several different segments, portions of your network, not just the one that uh, separates the corporation from the internet. So anyway. What is a bridge in the network context? OK, so bridge serves a similar purpose to a switch, I believe. And um, I'm trying to describe. A bridge basically just takes two devices and bridges them together, as for, say, like a real bridge would. So you can, you can bridge a device to another device. Thank you. So just to reiterate for the, for the, for the stream, and to put it in other words, uh, bridge is sort of like a less high-tech switch. It serves as a similar purpose in connecting multiple devices on the data link layer, or layer two of the OSI model. Uh, and a switch does that with, can, can do that with a larger number of devices. All right. If there are no other questions, I'm going to continue to infrastructure. Oh, never mind. So this picture, handy dandy um, image here to sort of show an a example of a very small network. So you've got your router and the modem, which connect to the, the internet at large. And after your router, you're going to have that firewall that filters uh, incoming traffic to make sure that the internet at large and Russian hackers and stuff aren't able to send malicious traffic to you. Or they will try, and hopefully the firewall will filter it out. So then you have that network switch, which again is sort of serving as a, a device to connect all of these other little nodes to the same local area network. And uh, in sort of like a small home office sort of deal, you might actually see all of these devices combined into one little device. It looks like you're, you're generally your uh, home wireless router serves all three of these purposes. But as you get into like the corporate world, uh, things scale up, and you might actually have, and you will likely have the two, di like the switch and the router are going to be two different machines. All right. So infrastructure. So before we uh, continue on into sort of high-level applications 
and demos that Andrew is going to do for us, I wanted to have a, a few words about what you can do on sort of a lower level with your infrastructure. So first thing, first protocol that I wanted to mention is uh, 802.1x, or authentication over Ethernet. So you know when you uh, connect to a wireless router, it's gonna ask, it generally is going to ask you for a username and password. And that sort of makes sense to us. You only want people on your, you, know, you only want to give your Wi-Fi to people that you know. But 802.1x, specifically over Ethernet, it's applying that same authentication protocol over Ethernet. And you know, Ethernet, it's, it's just a wire. It's that, uh, it's that fancy plug that you put in the wall, and, and hopefully now you have internet access. Or if you live in UV like I do, you curse UV for the lack of internet access. Anyways, so what is the purpose of adding this authentication uh, step to the, the port on the wall? It might seem a little bit silly at first. But sort of, if you think about it from an, from an attacker's perspective, maybe a penetration tester's perspective, they might be assessing the security. They might be assessing the security of a client, and maybe they're walking around in the lobby where the client might have regular guests, and they have one of those, and they have an Ethernet port just available on the wall. Anyone who connects to that Ethernet port has already gained access to their, to their local area network. Hopefully they have some, some other stuff. Hopefully they've segmented that part off from the rest of the network, but who's to say that that's the case? So adding authentication adds a little extra security from somebody just walking up and, and plugging straight into your network. Um, not, a not too terribly uncommon practice would be to uh, sort of, if you're, if you're really sneaky, if you're a really good pen tester, is to remove the cover on that uh, Ethernet uh, port and just sort of install a little computer, like maybe a little Raspberry device that connects straight to that Ethernet port and, and install the cover back over that, that, that port and it looks completely inconspicuous and you have a, a persistent uh, machine that's connected to the network. Super dangerous. You don't want that. And uh, even if you are, OK, you might say, well, if you don't suck at security, you're not going to have just loose Ethernet ports everywhere. And that's fair. But it's also possible that you know maybe your lobby has that one phone that nobody ever uses, but is there to look you know, professional and nice. Somebody could theoretically just come by, unplug that phone, plug in whatever they want, and bam, network, ac network access. We don't want that. So um, authenticating with 802.1x over Ethernet could help um, solve that sort of problem. So if you want to go even more hardcore and paranoid, you can look at IPsec. And now IPsec is, is a protocol that, that offers a, a, a number of different functions. You know, it, it, it can serve to authenticate, and it can also serve to encrypt traffic over a network. Um, in our context, what I'm really looking at is in encrypting traffic across your network. So theoretically, if someone was super hardcore, um, maybe they, they, they're working for that client, and the client has 802.1x authentication. Maybe there is some point on the facility where they can tap the Ethernet cord. Not unheard of. And if they were to do that, they could you know, very easily snatch credentials. It would 802.1x could be circumvented and bad things could happen. IPsec can be used to encrypt, uh, encrypt packets and frames within a network. So they could try. So even if they had a physical tap on your wire, they won't be able to get anything. Uh, now, VLAN segmentation. So um, VLAN, V stands for virtual, so virtual LAN. Essentially, the idea is that um, you have a decently nice switch. Some of the nicer switches come with this functionality, where essentially you can separate ports, actual physical ports on, on your switch, log into different logical virtual LANs. So in essence, you can, you can segment off everything that's connected to that switch into different uh, logical local area networks. And so why would you want that? That means that if you're 
connected to one of the virtual LANs on this switch, you cannot you do not have local area network access to the other virtual LANs because they are effectively uh, different local area networks. So you're sort of uh, segmenting your network into different purposes. So you don't really want your super mission critical stuff on the same network as the um, you know, guest internet. So uh, VLANs can be used to, to segment off. So even if one portion of the network gets compromised, it doesn't mean the whole thing comes tumbling down. But there are a couple of attacks to circumvent the function of VLANs. And those, these attacks are generally referred to as VLAN hopping. And the idea is to attempt to um, send traffic or receive traffic from other virtual LANs on your switch. So, so jump out of your VLAN and be able to see all of the other, uh, other VLANs. There are two general ways that this is done. One is called switch spoofing. And essentially the way that works, so the virtual LAN protocol requires that your switches be able to um, sort of still route traffic according to each, each different VLAN. And, and it determines which VLAN a packet comes from, a frame comes from, based on a tag that it slaps on there. Well, so theoretically, the, the switches, you know, they get access to all the traffic because it, it's impossible. You can, it, it's a necessity, right? So essentially, one attack is to connect to the network and tell the other switches, hey, I'm a switch too. I'm here to help you guys out. And so from there, you can uh, create any packets or frames you want, just slap whatever VLAN tag you want, and the other uh, switches are going to treat, it, treat, you like, treat that like normal traffic. So you can essentially circumvent the uh, protection that VLANs have given you. Now, very easy mitigation here is don't let your switches just trust other people to be switches. Um, configure them so that they don't negotiate uh, other helpers, essentially. Don't let them trust new devices that say, hey, I'm a switch, and you won't have this problem. Another, the other big way to hop out of a VLAN is referred to as double tagging. And um, essentially, on a switch, you have you potentially have your various user VLANs, and you also have the native VLAN for that switch. And the native VLAN is not going to have a tag. What you can effectively do, um, if it if it receives traffic from its native VLAN, it's going to take that that native VLAN tag and it's going to strip it out, strip it off, send it on its way. What you can sort of do is. Um, if you're connected to that native VLAN, you can construct your, your packets such that you include the tag for the native VLAN, but on top of that, you also include the tag for your victim VLAN. So essentially, you're going to send it to send that, those packets to your uh, switch. The switch is going to say, oh, this is, this is native VLAN. It's going to strip that native VLAN tag off, and then it's going to send it to the next switch. And that next switch is going to read where the last one left off, so it's going to see a VLAN tag of whatever you want. So when that happens, it's going to, uh, it's going to, you know, it's going to read that tag and interpret it, oh, it belongs on this, this other VLAN, and it's going to send the traffic that way. So you can effectively sort of circumvent these VLAN protections in this way. However, it's worth noting that wh whoever you're talking to can't talk back, because they're not also doing that double tagging thing. But you can, but you can uh, send malicious traffic to, say, a web server that's on a different VLAN that's supposed to be protected. And that can be very bad. Oh, no. Do I just refresh? Can you see him? Are they on now? Andrew doesn't trust me to touch his computer anymore. So I don't know why. Um, 
Oh, so it's worth mentioning, you don't have to use the Google thing to send questions. You can also just yell at me, and I will do my best to answer questions. So that should, is there questions now? Sweet. Can't wait to read all the lovely messages you guys have for me. All right. So yeah, so that's VLANs, that's VLAN hopping, and cool. And one last thing before I stop to officially ask for questions. I'm going to touch on Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi is awesome. Um, I love Wi-Fi. You know, we all do. Uh, very convenient. However, the introduction of Wi-Fi, wi like, brought some new challenges to information security, network security in particular. So normally, with your Ethernet cord, you've got those signals going back and forth on a wire. Uh, theoretically, they can be tapped, but that's sort of a pain to do. On the other hand, Wi-Fi is send rather than sending electrical signals on a wire, it's sending um, radio signals over the air. So essentially, anyone with an antenna has more or less sort of tapped into your, your network. <laughs> True. Um, so it brought some, some new challenges, and so uh, some new technologies were, were created in order to address those challenges. Your uh, Wi-Fi, your traffic is generally encrypted, um, and there is a authentication mechanism like 802.1x that's used over Wi-Fi. Um, oh, yes, you can see uh, there's a link to the UT Dallas OIT, How to the Comet Net, and you most likely saw this like your first day freshman year and you did that stuff, or if you're like some of the friends I know, you got sick of like UTD guest in sophomore year and finally, you know, went through that process. And so that's what they touch on is essentially this Wi-Fi security uh, infrastructure stuff. So, for example, I believe UT Dallas uses PEAP, P-E-A-P, which protected extensible authentication protocol. And um, in short, it uses some uh, a authentication mechanism. I think in UTD's case, they use MSCHAP. And then they encrypt their traffic, which is good. So just a few notes on Wi-Fi that you probably already know. Um, don't use WEP, don't use WPS, don't use WPA, and do use WPA2 until WPA3 gets popular and ditch WPA2. So somebody asks, how widespread is WPA3 right now? I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so not common yet. Sure. So W so WEP, WPA, and WPA2 are two, are a couple different iterations of that technology that was meant to solve the problem of oh basically everyone with everyone with an antenna has tapped into your network and that is to say they were they are encryption standards to make sure that you can send radio waves to everyone and only one person is going to understand them. And um, in short, WEP was the first standard that was created. It is outdated and very insecure and very easy to crack, so don't use it. WPA, um, I actually don't know as m many de many details about WPA, uh, what the changes were from, from one to two, but also outdated and upgraded to WPA2, which up until recently we all thought was like super awesome, but you guys have probably heard about that, that new exploit that came out a couple months ago. So WPA3 is coming out to, uh, to address that. WPS is not a encryption standard like those other ones. It is it stands for Wi-Fi Protected Setup. And it is to help old people set up their routers. And it is brute forceable, so you shouldn't use it. Are you satisfied? Okay, cool. All right. So I think now I'm going to pass the mic off Oh, actually, I should uh, I should read these questions first. I should, um, my bad, guys, letting you guys down. Is PEEP WPA2 vulnerable to crack? Crack is the new, <laughs> sorry, crack is the new um, vulnerability that came out 
against WPA2. And that's actually a good question, because my understanding of crack was that it, um, it might actually only apply to the personal shared key model, but I'm not sh for certain. Yeah, crack is not as like, good as many people. Like, it's, it's not as like, exploitable on networks as people think it is. You have to have a lot of the information about the network, and, and it takes a lot of time to, to crack that specific portion that it's using. So WPA3, basically what it does is it just doesn't let, it doesn't let a user get in between the connection between the router and the person that wants it. But peep versus like personal shared key, do you oh, know if it makes a difference? I think that it, I think, I think that's the solution. That's what WPA, the standard, basically said to use in order to fight crack. So yeah. Okay. I'm wasn't sure. But I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, peep helps defend against crack. But that's a very tentative answer. I'm gonna Google that as soon as I like go sit down, and uh, and maybe I'll get back to you. Um. Isn't WPA2 vulnerable? Yes, it is. Uh, what if old gaming systems can only connect online via <laughs> web? Well, then get hacked, man. <laughs> I heard WPA3 is vulnerable to crack. So what should be? WPA3 Enterprise is vulnerable to crack. Yeah. Oh. Since hackers encrypt your underlying encryption, not the opposite. Oh, OK. There's your answer. Thank you. So, so, so reiterating for the stream so that I don't give bad information to people and they don't sue me for getting you know, hacked. Uh, Peep does not protect you from, from crack. So when WPA3 comes out, use it. Um, somebody says, I heard WPA3 is vulnerable to crack. So what should be the alternative? Wired and smooth. <laughs> Just a really long wire. Yeah. That's I don't know of other alternatives other than other other than that. Sorry. The chances of someone trying to use crack on your Wi-Fi are very slim. It's it's also packed, like the Clarify. That was a client side vulnerability that no longer exists if you update. Yeah. So we'll get crack. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, the gals on Oslo still from like another you know. <laughs> you want to be that screwed then. Yeah. <laughs> get get like Tin cans with the wi you copper wire the between them. Someone on the screen suggests that if you're required to use WEP, you can take it to stick with Unix. I. Fair enough. Somebody. Oh, at least one person listening to my talk. That's awesome. What Thank do you. Mean? you. All these people listening to your oh talk. yeah, of course. All right, I'm going to pass the mic to my boy Andrew, and he's going to talk about firewalls. RIP uh, headphone users. Sorry. OK, so uh, I'm going to start talking. Let's go to the uh, firewalls. Uh, we talked about this last week, actually. Um, so I will be talking mainly about uh, things other than just you know services you can use on your local machine for, for firewalls. So uh, the basics of firewalls, I'm going to be going over this again just so like, if you don't know what it is or if you didn't watch the previous stream, uh, then here you go. So basically, firewall acts between a gate between the traf your traffic, uh, your switch and your router to your outbound traffic. Um, setting rules is basically you can set any kind of rules you want on your router. You can set uh, rules to allow traffic, to reject traffic, to uh, throttle traffic. I mean, a firewall doesn't really throttle traffic as much as you're not supposed to use it for throttling traffic, but you can. Uh, there's better services to do, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and then allowing uh, and blocking specific ports is another thing that you can do with the firewall. So uh, the first thing is a Windows firewall. If you have a host, we didn't talk about setting this last time uh, a couple of times, but here's just a picture, simple picture. You can set inbound rules and uh, outbound rules. And basically, this is what it looks like if you were to block an IP. You just write, it's super simple in Windows. You just click Add Rule, you type in the IP address, whether you want to allow it, deny it, whether you want it to be blocked or not blocked, if you want it to be blocked for a certain program or maybe not a program. Uh, this is on a Windows box I have. I think these are Microsoft IPs that I'm blocking. I don't remember why I set those rules. Uh, I don't use that box anymore. Um, so 
Uh, just going to skim through these because this isn't really what the talk is about. But the Linux firewall, as we talked last time, um, we talked about louder. Okay, is it? Oh, I think they're being sarcastic. Maybe I don't know. Anyways, so uh, the pseudo so for IP tables basically. Uh, th without using firewall D or UFW, you can set IP tables, IP table rules. So you can set the, t the rules to the out output or input, uh, the type of the port, the port itself, or the IP itself, whether you want it to be established or an accepted or uh, another protocol or denied. Um, but the real point is for routing with firewalls. So. This is a tool called PF, or this is a routing software called PFSense that you can install on a box. And basically, what this allows you to do is route traffic from your internal network uh, to an external network, and it processes all that data in between. So this is this is a simple page on how you set up. Uh, for people, sorry that we can't like bring the screen down; it's broken. But what you what you what it's telling you is that you can set a network. And what I'm doing here is I'm setting the network. Um, and I'm setting what IP I want and whether I want to allow it or not allow it. And then the destination is where it's going outbound uh, or in, inside of my network. So the source is what's coming in. The destination is what's on my network locally on the LAN. Uh, and then there's a couple of other features you can do with it. Uh, if you want to reject it uh, instead of blocking it outright, which basically sends a signal back that it was rejected. Um, and so that's, that's PFSense. There's a lot of different routing options that you can install on software. Um, but it basically just allows you to uh, route uh, stuff from your router. Um, so with PFSense, there's a great thing that you can do, network monitoring. And so you can monitor a lot of things on your network. You can monitor performance. And you might ask, well, what's performance monitoring really have to do with security? If you, someone's using your box, at 1 a.m. and you're sleeping, chances are you, someone's on your box that's not supposed to be. So you can basically track usage of CPU, your hard drive, your network usage. Um, and there's actually a lot more you can do with your network usage and specifically to see if someone is using your box when traffic is not supposed to be used on your box. So last semester when we talked about penetration testing, we talked about how you want to try to hide your traffic in with other people's traffic. Well, this is, this is the reason, because if I'm breaking into a place and they have this set up and I try to break in at 2 a.m., they're going to see that someone from an IP address or is breaking in at 2 a.m. and using their equipment. Um, so this is a, a traffic shaper on PFSense. You can basically select whether you want it to shape traffic on all of your WAN or on just certain computers on the LAN. Um, so if you enable this, basically it's, you're allowing it to set a bandwidth for that specific uh, uh, LAN group. And this is running. This was running in a virtual machine, so I didn't have multiple LAN set up. But like, let's say I had LAN 1, LAN 2, LAN 3. And I wanted LAN 1 to be my teachers, and LAN 2 to be my students, and LAN 3 to be IT people. I could give the IT people in the internal network, or if I was IT, I'd give them unlimited bandwidth. The teachers get a little bit more bandwidth, like uh, 25 kilobits per second, and the students get like 100 kilobits per second because they're students, and that's what we get. Um, so that's what traffic shaping does. You can manipulate the traffic that's coming in and outbound to a certain degree. And it's good because y you don't want someone on, on the network itself to try to break into another part of the network. It, it slows them down. Uh, it's not necessarily a security measure, but it is like a, a hassle if someone were to break in. Um, so packet monitoring. Uh, everyone's heard, not everyone, but most people have heard the tool Wireshark that lets you monitor packets being sent in and out on your local computer. Um, this, is, this is good because you can see what your computer is sending out um, and what your computer is uh, bringing in. But if you want to do this on a network level, uh, you can use the traffic graph or a lot of different graphs on PFSense itself. In a minute, I'll show you PFSense and like just kind of go through it. Uh, really quickly, but this is one of the graphs it shows. So you can see here um, the amount of uh, on the WAN network what's coming in and what's coming out. It's very small amounts because again, this is 
I just try to create a little bit of traffic, but this is running on a VM that doesn't have many, many, any boxes connected to it. So you can basically see what traffic and what time at one time was going in and out. And that's uh, a part of the you know, performance monitoring, is seeing what traffic was being put when. And so you can see if that's usual traffic or that's unusual traffic. Uh, so someone asked, uh, what is traffic shaping? So if I go back to traffic shaping, I'll try to explain this uh, a little bit uh, with less technical terms, I guess. Traffic shaping just lets you take the traffic that's coming in and out of a computer or your network. Preferably, you're shaping traffic for your, your network so you have general rules. Uh, it, it lets you take that traffic, and it lets you limit how much is being put in er, into the network and taken out of the network, what, how much upload and download you're getting. Traffic shaping can also be whether that person can have usage during certain times of the day. Um, it's just a policy put in place to allow a user to, instead of just simply g going to any website they want with however much bandwidth they want on whatever, ti whatever time they want, it lets you shape that traffic a little bit. It's, it, the word shaping is really well used in this term. Um, I don't see any more questions. So um, continuing on. Uh, there's intrusion detection systems. And this can be put in your routing solution. So if you have Snort or Sericata, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, these basically allow you to detect traffic and what it's doing. So instead of you just seeing a graph with 100 kilobits or 100 megabytes or 50 megabytes coming in and out of your network, you can actually see what those packets are doing. And because you can see what these packets are doing, you can set alerts up if you see malicious uh, code or malicious uh, activities. If someone's trying to end map you, someone's trying to scan you or exploit you, if someone's putting in a shell outbound from an external IP you've never seen before, uh, these alerts can really help in that. So if I, before I get into IDSs and IPSs, uh, I want to just quickly show you guys uh, the, the different, um, or what PFSense looks like. So this is what PFSense looks like. It's a VM on my box, on VirtualBox. That's why it says the BIOS is VirtualBox. Um, you can, you, typically, you'd want to implement this on a purpose-built box. So if you have an old computer that, ha that you can put a 10 gigabit Ethernet uh, um, PCIe uh, expansion slot on, you can turn that into a routing solution and then plug in all of your computers or your, all your switches into that routing solution. So if you wanted to do that at home, that's what you do. Um, I believe Nick has a specific routing solution that he uses, or like a box, uh, what, what is it, APU2? Yeah. Yeah, so PC Engine has boxes that you can you can download and put PF. I mean, not download, buy, <laughs> download more RAM, guys. Uh, <laughs> so you can buy these boxes and put PFSense or any type of routing solution on, and you can use that as your purpose-built router instead of using whatever router Comcast gives you or buying one from uh, Amazon or Best Buy or something. Yeah, mine's like a, it's a six inch by six inch box. It's got three gigabit connects on it, four gigs of RAM. Yeah. Yeah, I I would recommend to. Uh, I don't have one, but I plan on buying one soon. Um, but so this is PFSense. Um, just this is the quick dashboard. You can basically see the CPU usage. I think I'm giving it like one core at this time, so that's why the CPU usage is such high for an idle. Um, this is memory usage, um, the swap usage, and disk usage. So if we scroll up a little bit, we can see the di the different options. So if we go to firewall, we can look at rules. And basically, uh, what I was talking about earlier is you can add a rule. And adding a rule, the action is just if you want to block it or if you want to reject it. Um, so you set the rule there if I want to block, tr block traffic. Uh, and then if I want to block it on an IPv6 or IPv4, if I want to do both and have a range maybe. Uh, and then I can also do uh, set a single host, an entire network. So like, let's say if I wanted to block an entire uh, IP, IP range uh, from coming in. So if I wanted to block the entire IP range of China or Russia or every single IP from McDonald's, because McDonald's has been trying to hack me lately. Uh, <laughs> not really, but you know, whatever. Uh, so I can also um, block specific WANs and LANs inside of my network uh, from from the source. So like, if you want to block two computers in your network from talking to each other, you can block those. So on a school network, 
you wouldn't want Joe's computer being able to talk to Billy's computer and Joe hacking into Billy. So you would block all traffic between in between each person. Um, so and then the destination is basically the place that that traffic's going, as I explained earlier. This is just a quick show to show the interface for traffic shaping. Um, I can show you guys a little bit more since it's not a picture. So I can, if I wanted to block it on my WAN, I could I could throttle the bandwidth of how much this router gets from the external to internal, and this would throttle every computer that is attached to this to this network instead of just throttling a specific computer. If I wanted to throttle my LAN, and I had whatever computer I have on this LAN, I can I can b shape the traffic of that of those computers on that LAN. Um, you can also set queue times for login. Uh, if you want to set a queue time for how, how long they have to wait before they get uh, to, to accessing the internet, I guess, or the WAN. Um, and also you can set bandwidth. So if, if I want to give like common net three, six kilobits per second, that's, I can do that. Or, I mean, I can't set common net, but I can set the LAN in here. Um, and then for, these are some more services that you can use. So uh, having a personal router is really nice because when you buy something from Netgear or TP-Link or you buy something from, or you just rent out from Comcast like most people do, uh, you're limited on what options you can really do. You can do port forwarding, port triggering. They have a lot of, a lot of the newer routers even let you set up different firewall solutions and access control lists. But with this, you can install and set up every single individual option yourself. You don't really have to rely on their software doing it because you know what this is open source. I, I'm pretty sure uh, when I checked it was open source unless it changed in the next like 30 minutes. Um, but uh, another cool thing is like load balancers. If you have a ton of services, uh, you can if you have like virtual machines or services, you can load balance to say like these ports uh, can be distributed amongst uh, different computers on the network. Um, but I digress. That's PFSense for you in uh, a quick run through. So if we go back to the slides, um, PFSense, another cool thing you can do with PFSense is have IDS and IPS systems. Yeah, there's just a couple questions that you weren't answering. Yeah, okay. They were on, they were on um, Twitch, so I'll read them to you. Oh, okay. That's a good question. Uh, let me quote, go back to PFSense. And uh, so, are you talking? What are you talking about? Um, so, it's Bogon Networks. I'm not sure if they're labeled. Um, so there, they're listed as networks. Oh, here. Yeah, there. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know, uh, Nick. They're, do you? They're, they're invalid IP addresses. They're invalid IP addresses. Yeah. That's your answer. Yeah, you shouldn't be seeing traffic from them. So. An explanation of why you do that is because someone would try, maybe try to spoof or hide their IP address by using an IP address that's invalid. Uh, that's what that does. Uh, and the other question is, how does the firewall interact between two hosts on the same network? So uh, are they, I, I'm going to assume that they're talking about two hosts on a LAN network. Yeah. So um, the firewall, basically every computer has to go through the switch before it can interact with anyone else and switch and router. It, not necessarily the router, but just the, switch. just the switch. So you have to, your, your internet, you may think that you can just ping the computer, but you can't. You what? You don't hit the firewall. You don't hit the firewall? Oh. Really? Yeah, you don't hit the firewall. You just hit the switch? You just hit the switch. Oh, I mean, okay. Yeah, you can have post space. Okay, so if you have a switch, then your computer goes to the switch and goes through it goes to the uh, the next host. So that would take that to block that traffic. You would have to really have a host-based firewall uh, instead of a router-based one. Um, yeah. So are there any more questions? Okay. Uh, sorry for the confusion on that um, part. But uh, as I was saying, another cool thing that you can do with um, PFSense is you can have an IDS or IPS solution. So basically, uh, what IDS and IPSs are, are um, IDS is just an intrusion detection system, and IPS is intrusion prevention systems. Um, and so one of these systems that are really popular are uh, SNORT. And SNORT, what it basically does is it has rule sets that you can set in place, 
and with, will block traffic, will alert for traffic, or will, it's not a firewall per se, but it just has a way to set rules so that you can be alerted when certain things happen. Um, an IDS system, when it means it, it, it's detecting it, it's just telling you whether the packet itself uh, has a certain key string in it. So if we go to, if we look at the basic rule set, um, the first word is alert. So that's basically saying what the rule does. It alerts you if this happens. So if, it, if on the TCP, if any port and any IP address go to any port and any IP address, it sends a message to your log file saying uh, you've got traffic. And the reason I don't have the, the log file location here is because when you set up Snort, the, it asks you where you want to put the log information, so you set it yourself. Um, if you install it in PFSense, it will show you like a nice interface uh, of, of what like, has been done and what's being done. So if you install that on PFSense anyway. Uh, a more specific is uh, alert TCP external net to a specific internal net IP address on port 80. So basically, external net is a variable that is set in Snort, which is all the traffic that's externally from your internal network. Anything other than the device or the, the, the router that is routing the traffic. So that would be considered your WAN. Um, and then uh, not only that, but you can also set class types, which basically means that your log information will have different class types on where it's categorizing that traffic. So a uh, web application is basically saying that if it's connecting to this IP address, alert that there's um, a web application in use saying you've got port 80 traffic on that IP address. And that, that's what the class type is, is for. It's really helpful if you have a lot of different class types. Because I'm going to show you a rules file that has very long uh, words to it. And it's nice to have a class type. This is the rule I'm talking about. Um, this is uh, one of the community rules on Snort. You can download this. You can download the entire zip file with all the community rules. Uh, it looks very daunting because it has a lot of information. But this is one of the, um, the Metasploit uh, rules, rule sets to prevent Metasploit from uh, someone from breaking into your network using Metasploit. Or not prevent, really, but alert. Uh, so basically, you alert with a TCP and any external network on the home network. And then the message is going to basically say, if, it comp if it's composed of um, Metasploit, Meterpreter, Reverse HTTP certificate, then it's showing that the flow of the traffic is established and the different, co uh, di the different codes to show that it is Metasploit. Um, this is basically showing that this is reverse traffic, saying, um, like, each one of these lines is just saying that the context is um, the interpreter session in, in general. Uh, it's really hard to explain each one of these, like what the, each content does, because uh, you have to know the Metasploit module that's being used. Uh, so the community rule set's really nice for that. It has all of these in there, pre-written and tested to work. Uh, and if you download Snort, uh, I believe by default it has these rule sets that you can input into it. Uh, so another one that's popularly used, I use this one, uh, Sericata. It's similar to Snort, but it's multi-processed, so you can expand your network more. Um, it's easier to scale your network, basically. You can have multiple processes of Sericata running and allow for traffic to be uh, logged that way. So this is um, the traffic for blocking a Trojan, like bot. Uh, this is not, I didn't create this, this is from this website, from the Redmine wiki. Um, basically, what it does is this drops uh, traffic from the home net to an external uh, IP address, so a reverse shell, per se. Um, and it's basically blocking it from the server uh, content NIC, uh, and the class type is Trojan Activity. And you can also add references. Um, that's just more for documentation purposes if you want to document what, what your rule does and why your rule is in doing that. Uh, just so that if someone else comes along, wants to read your rules, they know to where, where to go to see why you put that rule in place. Uh, so then I'm going to give it back to our community manager, Jake, to talk about network security policies, because that's such a fun topic. Let me actually see if there's any questions real quick. Um. Okay, so someone asked what uh, what is uh, 
meterpeter. It's pronounced me, me, <laughs> it's pr pronounced meterpreter. Meterpreter is the shell that Metasploit uses, which is a hacking tool uh, that allows you to break that that allows you to it, Meterpreter is basically the shell instead of Bash, where it gives you a lot more options and tools inside of Metasploit. And if you use the Metasploit module, you most likely will have a Meterpreter shell on the box, and it sends a specific stream of data that allows you to catch that data that per se. Okay, so host IDS is basically when on your host box, all the da traffic that's coming in and out uh, on that specific one box. Um, and then a network IDS or IPS is basically set up on the routing solution that goes, that's logging all the traffic coming into the network and out of the network for any box on that, on that uh, network, on the local area network, connecting to any box on the wide area network. And I don't think I explained this, but your wide area network doesn't necessarily have to be your internet. Uh, your wide area network could just be a connection to another router. Uh, a lot of bigger networks have multiple routers where they have a router for a building that connects to an, a more centralized routing solution. So every building connects to that one router. So it does, WAN doesn't necessarily mean the internet. It just means your wide area network, as Jake explained. Um, what is the difference between blocked uh, and rejected rules uh, for a firewall? So Nick's smiling because he doesn't think I know the answer to this. Um, and I don't know the answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I, I, this is what I think it is. I could be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but a block basically stops the traffic in its feet and rejected sends a signal back saying that the traffic is rejected. And by Nick nodding his head, that means I'm right. So he can laugh his way home. Um, and was there any other questions? Um, uh, can traffic? Uh, can a fire? Can I firewall traffic from the same subnet or VLAN? Um, rather, can rather the firewall traffic between two hosts on the same network? So, uh, as we explained earlier, I think I answered this question earlier, but I'll I'll say it again. Um, you'd have to have a host-based uh, firewall solution to block traffic between two networks. Um, not necess you can't what the or the same the same network between two hosts my bad um, you'd have to have a firewall a host based firewall solution that's on one of the boxes or both of the boxes itself uh, so I will take it off if there are there any can a network can a network based traffic ideas view encrypted traffic so no technically uh, you can SSL strip, of course, and like that's a thing that a lot of people do. Uh, you're not supposed to, and it's not really, it doesn't really happen that much. But that's why HTTPS is regarded as like a better shell to have rather than a reverse TCP shell. Uh, but <laughs> is there more questions? So I was just laughing that your example of why HTTPS is better is for exploitation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, coming from a pen tester perspective, ACPS is better because it's easier to break into stuff because the data is encrypted and it looks like normal traffic. Um, but as far as like having a, looking at it, you can kind of see the encrypted traffic and look see if it's suspicious of any type, or you can compare it to the interpreter because HTTPS interpreter is online. You can compare that encryption with the one that's being sent and see if it's similar. And if it is, you can compare and say, OK, well, that's an interpreter session. So you don't necessarily need to decrypt the traffic. You can just kind of look at the traffic and, and, and compare it with a known um, uh, Metasploit module. It's pretty common uh, early on when you're building your, your network to take sort of a baseline of what your traffic should look like. And that makes it a lot easier later to, to compare what's going on to you, even if there's some encrypted stuff and uh, I think that's it for questions. So Jake's gonna, I'm gonna hand it off to Jake for his awesome policy talk. Oh yeah. It's your boy. Um, all right. So I actually don't plan like I. This is deceptively named because I don't plan on boring you guys with like gritty details about how to develop a comprehensive network security policy for your company. So um, really what I want to touch more on is, heh, more on, 
touch on more is like security culture and how it's going to affect um, social engineering threats. So what do I mean by security culture? Well, I'm going to tell you guys a story. Um, so say there's a company, and they're trying to make a secure network, and they've got the big IT boss man, or maybe like a security consultant or a penetration tester, and he's running down his list. He's making sure that this network is extra super secure. He's got his IDS. He's got the firewalls configured all nice. He's, he's uh, using IPsec and 802.1x on his Ethernet ports. Everything's good. But then, one day, Olga from accounting gets a phone call from the county password inspector, right? And the county password inspector is like, hey, I really need to make sure that your password's secure. So she's like, oh, OK, my password is 12345. And the password inspector's like, Gucci, that's a perfect password. Please don't change it. And, um, you know, or maybe, maybe, you know, a phishing email got passed through some, some filters. Maybe she uh, let a guest onto the facility without escorting them. Or maybe she did escort them and the guest saw her password on a sticky note on her computer, you know. You guys see where this is going. And all of that sort of, all of that time and money that Mr. Security Consultant Professional Man put into securing the network is for naught. And so we hear, we envision Olga getting bamboozled by the county password inspector. And our, as tech savvy individuals, our, our, our first sort of response, or at least in my case, was sort of like roll your eyes and you know, talk that up as a loss because of stupid users. Well, uh, I would say that security professionals really need to strike that phrase out of their vocabulary. So you've, you've heard that, that phrase that a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. Well, if you were with us last semester when we were doing more attack-oriented presentations, you know that one of the weakest links is users. Social engineering can be incredibly effective. Uh, effective. So we should really focus on strengthening that link. And to do that, I would report that we need to change I, the sort of security culture and not call our users stupid, not make them <coughs> like dread having to deal with IT. You know, um, What you really want to do is make users a part of your security team. Uh, don't just encourage them to speak up when something is new and weird. Uh, Make sure it is their duty to do so, and make sure that they know that you that they are a vital part of your security team. And if you do this successfully, you'll be able to turn one of the greatest weaknesses in your network to a very handy resource. And that link down there is to a um, it's a DEF CON talk that's actually on physical security. I'm not going to play it now, um, but I figured I'd link it be because it it ties in with uh, social engineering, and also I drew some a decent amount of inspiration from this video. And it's also very entertaining. I think it's called uh, um, Steal Everything, Kill Everyone, Cause Total Mayhem. Uh, I highly recommend it. I'm gonna, we're, we'll link it in the, in the Slack. And after this, you should check it out if you get the time. But um, yeah, that's, a, that's about all I have. If you guys have any questions, I'm going to read through these too. But if you have any questions. Uh, I don't see any new ones. Yeah. OK, so um, that's all I got. The CSG people are going to hang around in this room for, for a little while afterwards if you want to come up and, and chat with us individually. If not, thanks for coming. And uh, enjoy the rest of your Valentine's evening.